residents from the village and guests as well as uh, family members of, uh, of Garrick uh, Green. I see a couple of, of tables here. I think that's really, really terrific. I've known Garrick for a long period of time. I remember his student days at McPherson College. And one of my predecessors, Norma Tucker, used to share with me that one of the neatest things about being a dean at McPherson College is seeing how those persons you employ blossom and grow. And uh, Garrick was one of those persons that I had an opportunity to employ and to bring back to McPherson College. So it's really special to have him here today. Some of you may have uh, remembered his presentation probably, what, about a year, year and a, year and a half ago, something probably like that. Two. So. We, I see we also have a number of woodworkers here as well today, and he said, Gary told me, he said, in addition to the, the family, he has a table of hecklers back here as well, so. <laughs> but without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you Amanda Gutierrez, who's uh, stepping in for Monica Rice today. Amanda is no stranger to us. She is uh, Vice President for Automotive Restoration. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon, it's good to be with you. Hello, it's good to see you. You're right up front. You don't hide at the back anywhere. I would like to uh, make a few announcements uh, before I do kind of a secondary introduction of Garrick. We are excited to report that Power Day 2018, Power Day you may know is our annual day of giving, was a huge success. A lot of you in this room helped us reach our goals. We received totaling, gifts totaling $122,407 from 239 alumni and friends, and 30 of those were first-time gifts to the college. So we were really excited to, to see that we're generating a new interest in supporting the college because we know many of you have been supportive for so many years, and, and it's time for, for some other people to step up and join you, and so we were really pleased with those results. Another announcement we've been asked to make from the college's English department is that they're putting together an online creative arts journal to feature McPherson College alumni. So if you're interested in submitting something, you can send them via email, and I've got that information. I'll, I would give it to you now, but it's not going to mean anything if you can't write it down. They want a biography of you and also your connection to the college. They're looking for poetry, short fiction, and creative nonfiction, and that can also include personal memoirs or essays. Uh, also, photography. So uh, you'll hear more about that. I'm sure that we'll be sending something out. They want uh, all of those things submitted by April 14th. Uh, the final announcement I would make is I put these on, I put a copy of one of these on each table. This is our new automotive restoration magazine. And uh, they haven't even been mailed out yet, so you're among the first to see them. But the idea is uh, particularly to connect with some of those people in the automotive industry across the world that we know and create a piece that talks not only about the college but about things that are happening in the industry and how McPherson College is impacting those. So um, there's a lot of information on that that I'd love for you to take a look at that and um, stay in touch with what we're doing in the automotive restoration portion of McPherson College. So Garrick Green. Garrick uh, has served as our department chair for the last... It was 13 years. 13 years. Um, and he decided it was time for him to uh, take a sabbatical and really focus back uh, less on running the department and really entrench himself in the classroom. And I have to say, I got to work with Garrick the last five or six years as department chair, and he and I worked on a number of things together, and I wasn't really sure what I was going to do when he decided he didn't want to be department chair anymore. <clears throat> he is a man of integrity who led that department, managed the budget, took care of a lot of things that people don't recognize go on in the automotive restoration side of academics, from catalog and coursework, all kinds of things, and just really was a champion for our program. And I valued getting to work with him and getting to know him better. And I'm very excited now that he doesn't have to deal with all that stuff, because you're going to see the things that he gets to uh, focus on now and share with our students. Garrick, in addition to being department chair, he uh, teaches junior seminar, leads senior projects, he teaches machining, he has taught paint, and now he's teaching woodworking. 
and which you will see is not only a great skill, but also uh, one of his deep passions. And I'm just so pleased to have him back here to share with you again because it makes me proud. I knew him as a student as well. And it just, it makes me proud to get to work alongside of him and to share the talents of our team with all of you. So here is Garrett Green. Thank you for that introduction. <laughs> Appreciate that. So when I was asked to uh, present today, I was uh, um, given a topic of perhaps talking about woodworking. And for me, that is a, uh, a huge topic that I could speak about for uh, many, many hours. Don't worry, I won't go that long with, with you all. So um, what I wanna focus on today is I'm gonna spend a few slides and uh, some introduction time talking about sort of the tradition of woodworking in, uh, in our uh, United States and how that has been a, a big part of our nation's development. I'll give you a little bit of background uh, about how I got to be involved in woodworking, and then I'll cover some of my uh, work with the sabbatical uh, training and, and learning that I was uh, doing in the fall. And then as anybody has questions during any of that, please uh, speak up and chime in. And I'm sure if you have a question, most likely somebody else has that same one. So uh, don't feel uh, bad at all about interrupting and uh, asking questions. So I'll start, start with uh, a little bit, like I said, of an introduction. I came up, I, I stole the title of my presentation from a guy named uh, Eric Sloan, and he wrote this neat little book. It is a really quick read, and uh, he called it A Reverence for Wood. Eric Sloan previously had written extensively about early American industry, and hand tools, and he got started in that direction and quickly realized there was a gap where he realized many of these tools were made out of wood or were intended to use on wood. And so he's written this nice little book, but uh, some of the interesting things that he's said in there is that centuries of Americans have depended on our valued natural resource of trees and that really hasn't stopped, even though we have many other resources, plastics and, and metal and a lot of those things, but there's nothing like the combination of the strength of wood and the look of wood. When it comes to construction, there's something really warm and inviting about a home that has a lot of woodwork or wood beams in it, for example, or a car that has some exposed woodwork and just the beauty that brings to the other materials that are uh, in contact with that. So it really is a complementary material that we use. He also states in that book that, and I hadn't really thought about this before I got more involved in doing woodworking, but most early Americans knew wood and trees better than our modern experts. So the average American would, know, would have known a lot more about wood and trees than I know, or even some of our experts know, because their lives depended on it. They needed that for shelter, they needed that for uh, warmth, they needed that for anything that was made out of iron, because they had to make the charcoal out of wood to be able to, to forge that. So very important resource that we've had and I'll tell you what, uh, many of the accounts that I've read about early Americans coming to the United States and they see these vast, vast forests, in, especially in the New, New England states, they were thinking, oh my word, this is heaven, look at all these trees we can cut down. So, <laughs> obviously that did not happen. Not all of our trees have been cut down. Uh, some of the best trees were earmarked for the king to make the king's ships, they would have a cross uh, cut into the sides of these trees, so. Okay, many of you who uh, have any interest in watching PBS will recognize this character. Uh, Roy Underhill is a guy who really understands the joy of woodworking. He's a, he's a fascinating guy to watch, and if you've ever seen the Woodwright shop on PBS, does that f sound like a familiar? TV show, 
uh, he really has a zest for doing woodworking. And uh, he gets in there, and I've seen him do live presentations. I was telling somebody earlier, if I were Roy Underhill, I'd be up on this table sawing something by the time this thing was over, uh, much like Ed with his, uh, with his panel beating uh, demonstrations. He's just a very um, exuberant guy when it comes to that. I think he's been responsible for getting uh, a number of Americans interested in doing woodworking and woodworking in a traditional sense, not lots of band saws and table saws, even though those are good, but uh, it's amazing what you can do with a few simple hand tools, a small toolbox, and having a good wood woodworker is the main part of having a good toolbox. So he's popping out of this, uh, what is called a, a Dutch toolbox. Going back to some of our early history, just really quickly, a couple of slides that demonstrate how early Americans uh, felt about the tree as part of our natural resource that, that we couldn't do without. So one of the very first American coins struck, uh, this is from 1667 to, to 82, so before the United States was even a nation, you can see the tree struck on that coin from Massachusetts. The Continental flag, right as the nation was becoming a nation, uh, had this tree on it. This was uh, called the Liberty Tree. And so, as I understand it from reading, and, and Eric Sloan talks about this in his book, the barns or the structures where some of these early uh, patriots would, would meet were called um, well, the places where they were meeting was underneath the Liberty Tree that would be sticking out of the top of the barn so you could identify that that was part of what they were um, accomplishing there is that piece of uh, liberty from, uh, from England. So it was very important to them. I've discovered this, uh, you know, this great history as I've now studied the subject more. And uh, so I'll spend a little bit of time telling you about some of the areas that I've studied um, more so than others as I've done my sabbatical. But let me briefly uh, stop to just give you a little bit of information about uh, how I got into woodworking and the, my background a little bit. So um, if you, uh, so several people here will already know this information. So you can chime in if you want to add to it. Uh, I grew up in Southern California in the Los Angeles area, and uh, both my parents uh, taught. In fact, my mom is right here. She taught special ed for a bunch of years. And uh, so what a saint, right, for teaching special ed all those years. Uh, my dad taught um, industrial arts back when industrial arts were not two bad words put together. Uh, and so I think we're returning actually to where industrial arts is not as frowned upon as it used to be. But I had some early exposure to woodworking through, uh, through my dad who had a, a fairly good uh, home shop because he taught industrial arts, he, he had that equipment. I learned to do simple woodwork both at home and through school in uh, what was it, uh, probably junior high, I had a woodworking uh, teacher who famously had no thumb because those things happen. Uh, oh, this, is, uh, this is 20 years of doing woodworking and, and machining, so, so far so good, knock on wood. All right. And uh, so currently I'm in my 17th year of teaching at McPherson College. Uh, as was pre previously mentioned, 15 years of teaching uh, paint. And uh, as I've tra transitioned out of that, uh, we needed somebody to step into woodworking. So I, I now teach woodworking and machining at the college. So enough about me. So as, as we enter into a, a, a different phase of, of woodworking, uh, does anybody recognize this set of doors. It's, fairly, it, it, it's a fairly famous um, entryway, and uh, the Procter & Gamble family, one of the uh, owners there, 
the Gambles. They uh, contracted Green and Green, no relation to us. Uh, they have an extra E at the end of their name, so the Irish version, if you will. Green and Green were two uh, famous architects, and um, so the Gamble family contra contracted them to build them this house. It's called the Gamble House. It's located in Pasadena, California, and this is their entryway. All mahogany, stained glass, and this is the Tree of Life. And what a beautiful entry to come into. Very warm, very inviting. And uh, that's one of the things that I really find uh, very interesting and appealing and rewarding about woodworking is uh, it is a warm, inviting uh, material to use. It um, can give you a warm, inviting uh, feeling in, a, in use. And so that's, uh, that is something that I really am interested in. So uh, about five years ago, as we enter in the, into this new phase, I'm, I'm starting to maybe phase out of teaching automotive painting. A former instructor of mine called, we have stayed in touch and said, hey, what are you doing this summer? I want to build a chair. It was about five years ago. And so the chair that's on the left hand of this slide is my first kind of big foray into a big project. This is called a curved arm Morris chair. It was built by the Stickley Company, which is uh, located out of New York. And the Stickley brothers are pretty famous for their, what is called arts and crafts style furniture. So most of the furniture or things that I'll show off will either have a Japanese influence or arts and crafts like this. So that one summer, we built this curved arm Morris chair. Probably uh, took us about 120 hours to build a chair. Um, incidentally, he wanted to build a chair because we went and looked at buying one of these, and they're about $4,200. But if you build it yourself, you can make it for something like $1,000 between materials and leather. So it's still not free for sure, but it was my first foray into a big project. So then I built the little table that's uh, beside it. Then I built the bookcase that's behind it. And so the snowball begins and uh, it's hard to stop that once you get going. I also built this clock that goes on our mantle. And so that was like one um, reinforcement after the other of, yeah, this is something I'm interested in. This is a, a, a style that I could see making again and again. So maybe at some point my entire living room will be handmade. That would be awesome. Kind of a unwritten goal for me. So uh, a few years ago, I also uh, started toying around with building some uh, keepsake boxes. Um, so uh, coming back kind of maybe full circle, the first of these keepsake boxes was uh, for my father's ashes about when he passed. And, uh, but I've been continuing to refine the style and make additional ones. And uh, that's, a, that's a pleasing style, I think, for me. You can see the Japanese influence to the top. And it really makes for a nice project as you're leading um, first time woodworkers through a project. I've actually done this box with a group of homeschool kids. Youngest one was 13. And so it, it's a good project for that age. Impressions? What do you th that that uh, box is um, 200 cubic inches because that's how much cremains you have. So uh, about 200 cubic inches. It's um, 12 by seven, something about like that. So fairly small, slightly smaller than the one that's right here. Uh, materials wise, that is uh, air dried cherry. I mentioned air dried because it does matter how it is dried. Uh, you get a lot more life and color out of naturally 
cured wood than you do uh, the wood that is forced to uh, become dry. And very subtle bird's eye maple uh, is the panel inside of that cedar lined. So I've also, <laughs> make me a little bit emotional here, but I've also been able to uh, get my daughter to do some woodworking and she loves it. So that's her first box. You guys can come up and look at that earlier. Uh, she was able to make this earlier than this box. This is her second one. Uh, this is in grandma's possession now. That was her Christmas present for grandma. But I've been able to uh, show her how to hand cut dovetails using a saw and chisel. Um, certainly I've helped her a little bit, but she's done 98% of the work. And uh, again, she really likes doing that type of thing. So we've got young folks that are also interested in, in doing this type of work. And it also gives me a really great thing to needle my current students with if they're just not coming along very well, I can, I can say, but look, a 10 year old can do it, you know? So let's, let's go. And uh, anyway, that all in good fun though. All right, so back in the fall, I uh, was granted sabbatical. Unlike many sabbaticals where it is uh, like heavily intensive in doing research and you know, maybe focused on publication, some sort of publication. Uh, I was granted sabbatical to be able to mainly focus on woodworking. Uh, the reason for that is taking a skill that I had, but not comfortable really teaching it quite the way that I wanted to. And so uh, I, I did over 200 hours of um, woodworking during that sabbatical time, and also got to do a really neat trip to uh, North Carolina. So I did a three day uh, intensive class that was like uh, all day for those three days in a one-on-one -on -one situation with a guy named David Fink. And David Fink is a guy who literally wrote the book on making hand planes out of wood. And he is also a luthier and this is a uh, sample uh, picture of one of his violins. So he's made violins, he's made gorgeous, gorgeous uh, guitars, and just fascinating work. So he and I were uh, able to work one-on-one, -on -one, and uh, the purpose of that class was get a little more experience, especially with uh, sharp tools and how to set up a plane, and I'll be showing you just a little bit about that at, at a later time, and to really help me uh, with my curriculum, I brought some of the materials with me for him to critique and go through and see what he would add or subtract from what I was doing. Uh, thankfully, he was pretty lenient with the red pen. So uh, I think I was headed on the, on the right track and uh, he gave me some really neat, uh, good, helpful hints on what else to include. And I think that makes for a pretty strong uh, offering in woodworking at the college level. So he's located in Boone, North Carolina, an area of the country that I've not been to ever, but was excited to, uh, to give it a try. And so on the right is me roughing it in a little cabin there in Boone, North Carolina. It's in the mountains where there's uh, some pretty good skiing during the winter. Uh, this was fall time and the leaves were just starting to turn color. Beautiful, beautiful area. I'd go back there in a heartbeat. Uh, on the left is an example of the blanks of wood that I started with to make this wooden hand plane, and so you'll see more about that. Again, the wooden hand plane was not so much about the tool, but learning some of the techniques and learning how to really explain to students how do these tools work and what can they be used for that'll benefit me. So just another shot of the little uh, area that I was staying on the left. And then the finished uh, hand plane there on the right. I've been told since that it looks a lot like a uh, old fashioned tape dispenser. Probably see a little, little bit of the resemblance there. So you can see it from the side. 
So he and I, over the three days, we spent most of the first two days making the pieces and cutting the angles. And then the morning of the final day was all about fitting very, very carefully the blade inside of the hand plane. The idea is that we want the blade to be able to have just enough room between the blade and the rest of the plane to only pass the thinnest piece of a paper thin cut. And if, if you do that, you will actually be able to produce um, wood surfaces that do not need any sanding. In fact, if you sand them, it will take them backwards as far as how fine the finish will be. It almost comes out as a mirror smooth finish. So you can see a pile of shavings there on the left. So it's getting better. The ones on the left are a little bit small. So as I tuned up the uh, plane, it ended up cutting better. And here's an example of one of the lids, uh, very similar to this. But you can see from the, the backlighting that that lid is actually polished smooth and glossy. And that's, uh, that's one of the things that we don't think of being able to achieve with some of these hand tools. We think that, uh, at least uh, many of the, my students do, we think that, man, we just have to keep sanding and sanding and sanding and eventually we'll put a, a heavy, maybe a layer of urethane finish on this and then it will be smoothy, smooth. Well, I don't add any uh, clear coat finishes to my woodwork and yet they are very glossy and that's basically b coming back to the finish that you're able to get with these planes. So with that said, uh, each of the tables has a little bit of uh, shavings off of the plane that I brought with me. And um, so you can kind of inspect and see it's very, very thin. If we were to measure this, this would be less than the thickness of a human hair right around one third of the thickness of a human hair. So very thin. And I would encourage you, I've already seen some, I would encourage you to smell it. Can you, can you smell? One of the other things I love about woodworking is there are some woods that are just heavenly to work with as far as they look nice, it feels nice to the touch, and in the case of Port Orford Cedar, which comes from a small area of coastal Oregon. It has a very fragrant smell to it. Almost like citrus, maybe eucalyptus. So. What, what is this? Uh, uh, Port Orford Cedar. So it comes from just a small region of coastal Oregon. Uh, what I have here is the wooden blank that these shavings have come off of. Uh, there along the coast of Oregon, there are all these little shops that are selling blanks like this. And there are several species of trees that are uh, ideal for making, or at least partially, for the making of wooden instruments. Uh, this happens to be a ukulele blank, and so you would cut this in half, and then you would have the top for a ukulele, a little bit bigger blank, and then you could make a guitar out of it. So uh, that's where that's what they're selling these boards for. And if you, it's got it's got a bit of a ring to it, just without doing anything to it, and that's what is attractive for using this for an instrument. I paid $15 for that guy. The other piece was, uh, I also bought another blank of what is called Sitka uh, spruce, which is largely what the spruce goose is made out of, the big airplane. Um, the, I think the same blank was $20 for the Sitka spruce. So $15, you know, for making an instrument, not a big expense, but uh, in comparison to a two by four, yeah, I mean, this is, you could buy a lot more material for that price. So, uh, in addition to making the 
uh, hand plane with David Fink. Uh, he also uh, had me make the little adjusting hammer. So all of the adjusting on this is by tapping either the blade or if you need to back it up, you would tap on the back right here. A couple of good taps actually makes the wood move, but the metal stays in place and that backs the blade up. So it's like, well, I'm gonna hammer on this nice, yep, absolutely. Yeah, you just little tap, little tap, and then that will move that around. I have so, another question. Yes, sir. The, the blade, do you round the ends on both the ends or how? Um, the blade, as far as, let me go ahead and take this out. So, and this guy is razor sharp, so I'm, I won't be passing it around, but. So, this way here, there is a very subtle curve. It's only maybe the thickness of a piece of paper less on each side. And uh, so you, is that what you're asking? Yeah, good observation. If you had this perfectly straight across here, the corners would tend to dig in. Once you got a panel nice and flat, you would end up digging here and here. So a subtle curve will give you uh, just a, present the middle of the blade to when you're, when you're putting that to the woodwork. And leave no tracks. Do you grind That's it by it. hand? Yes. Mm -hmm. Grind it by hand and then uh, do hand honing on a uh, what they call a Japanese water stone. So that will be able to, within a few strokes, get that pretty, pretty sharp. Like I said, we focused uh, on getting it razor sharp and that's, that was one of the benefits of being able to do this class is getting his input on change your hand just a little bit here because um, I'm a firm believer and we can learn a lot from books. Uh, the reason I knew about this guy was from reading his book, but having just that little subtle change in something I was doing was really, really helpful. So other questions related to hand planes, woodworking, like uh, cutting, making chips. All right. So one of the other things that I focused on during my sabbatical was doing some uh, hand-drawn illustrations for my presentation materials. I just have two examples in here of uh, things that I was sketching in the evenings in between reading. I did a ton of reading, uh, read uh, just about everything I could get my hands on woodworking related. And what I've noticed about reading that type of uh, material is it goes much more slowly for me. I was able to read a couple of books really quickly. They weren't woodworking related because the woodworking stuff is very technical. I need to understand it. So just helping the students understand, you know, what's going on. Uh, so that's as I talk about how we machine these, uh, these, these timbers. This would be considered a a timber, if we were speaking with somebody English especially, uh, how do we machine that, depending on what, what type of uh, equipment do we have? Uh, so I worked on some of those illustrations. I think those worked, uh, worked nicely in my materials as well. So that's largely uh, the extent of the kind of the technical side of what I did uh, during my sabbatical. The next few slides are just some examples of the work that I either did just prior to or finished up during my sabbatical. So uh, you can see my daughter Emily's uh, finished box for grandma on the left and then the box that I brought with me today right here on the right. I think they compare pretty nicely. So I'm, I'm quite proud of her for getting that done. Took us over a year of week, mostly weekends working on it, but uh, it was never like I had to drag her. She was always the one dragging me into, hey, can we go work on the box? Yeah, we can go, you know, and then we didn't maybe have enough time, as, as much time as she wanted, and then we'd go in another day. Hey, here. Yes. I might just add, it was fun in the summer to go over to the shop 
and she would have signs she had written on her pieces of wood, and she would say, Emily's don't touch. I meant. <laughs> or she, she'd have little signs on there that <laughs> indicating that it was so fun to walk through there and yeah. see that, that she was making sure her stuff was not going to be disturbed by anybody. Did I ever tell you why she she started writing? So her, her notes were preceded by uh, that lid right there is a second lid for her box. The first one, somebody cut in half and used for something else. And that's when she started putting her note on there. It was like, because she, she asked me, you know, where's, where's the lid to my box? And I said, I don't know, it was right here. And a couple days later, I noticed a student had it. And they had no idea that it, they did something wrong. But she, she was like, did you find out who did that? Like, I'm going to talk, you know, I want to talk to him. And I said, I've handled it. Don't, you know, don't worry. Uh, but let's leave a note so that everybody knows that this is your, your stuff. So. so I also tried my hand at doing a little bit of carving during sabbatical. Uh, great time to be able to kind of expand your uh, experiences or your knowledge. Carving's uh, not something that I've done before. And so I like the idea of carving. You can turn just about any pruning off of your trees in your yard into usable things like spoons. And this happens to be a uh, butter knife in very much a Scandinavian style. It's a pretty typical uh, Scandinavian uh, look. So uh, that happens to be a piece of red bud. So the red buds are just about to start blooming. I mean, any day now they'll be bright pink and purple around here, but this is just a pruning and tried my hand at, at uh, carving. It's a great technique because uh, every little undulation that you make in there, the grain changes direction and you have to accommodate or else what you thought would be the the uh, handle, you know, where it bulged out will actually be split off of there if you go the wrong direction. So I tried my hand at doing some turning, which is a process that I have not uh, done before. So I picked up a old Diston coping saw at um, the Reuse It Center, spent I think maybe a whole dollar on that, and then uh, made a handle to go to it. That was the main thing that was missing on it. It was missing a handle and a screw, so I added those two. Uh, I made a marking knife, so that was a little more detail oriented as far as turning. And uh, had a template to work with and bought a kit from a guy who makes these uh, really nice marking knives. That knife blade at the, at the tip is razor sharp and it's designed to leave marks in your wood for laying out where you're going to cut. Uh, I was able to finish up a picture frame. So, and that was a kind of a neat way to uh, capture some of our photos from uh, Crater Lake when we went to Crater Lake. So that's one of my pictures that I uh, took last summer on our trip to Oregon. So beautiful place if you've not been to Crater Lake. How many, probably many of you have been to Crater Lake? Yeah, gorgeous, gorgeous place. So you're driving along and it's like nothing's out here and then all of a sudden you start climbing and then you get to something like this. Uh, Rod Gieselman, if you guys are familiar with him, was here uh, the same summer, just three weeks before I was. They could not get past the very first entrance road. Everything was still packed with snow in July, early July. Gary? Yes? Isn't it true that that lake does not have an outlet? Does not have an outlet. That is correct. Everything is contained within that crater. Yeah, so they're very um, picky about who, who or what makes contact with the water to not introduce uh, outside organisms into that really unique system. No motor boats. What's that? No motor boats. 
Uh, they do have one boat, but it, I don't know if it is um, gasoline powered or maybe an electric so that it doesn't pollute it. Uh, and at one time they stocked it with fish, but that wasn't the case beforehand as I understand it. So anyway, that's more of that same cherry, uh, air dried cherry. Big fan of using that. It's a beautiful wood to work with. It's a very warm wood when it's finished. So uh, finished up a, a mallet and uh, this mallet was made out of white oak and Osage orange. So if you've been around the farm at all, all those hedgerows of Osage that are really thorny, if you're familiar with those, it can, it can produce some beautiful um, furniture with that wood. It's very hard and it's a little, it's a little bit of a uh, struggle to work with, but I think it's well worth it. So that's the mallet head. It's very dense. It's a heavy, heavy wood. Uh, incidentally, the hand plane here is also Osage orange and it has been treated with ammonia to make it dark. So there's no finish on it, but just ammonia reacting with the tannic acid in the wood will turn it dark. So the assembly mallet is a, uh, a useful tool, much like the hand plane is, much like the hammer is. Uh, a lot of what I've made tool-wise is to use, so not to be a um, mantelpiece or anything. My work was not strictly furniture related. Uh, also uh, finished up a door. This is one that Ed's really familiar with because he's seen several of these come through his sheet metal area, but we have a 1929 Stutz Blackhawk at the program and there's a neat door on the rear of this car that gives us some, uh, some interesting curves and construction to work with to get the students familiar with some of the automotive construction using wood. Does anybody know of the one automotive manufacturer that still uses wood with um, uh, some regularity in their cars? Anybody know? Not that table back there. <laughs> Uh, decoratively, yes, but in their construction, not any longer. You're in the right continent, right island even. Morgan, yeah, so you got the Morgan. You would have had it. Yeah, Morgan still uses um, quite a bit of plywood in their cars. They're small, uh, sp sporty sports cars and uh, they still use plywood because it li it's light and it's strong to the great um, characteristics of most wood products. So as we wind up here, just a couple of reflections. Um, there's nothing like standing in the redwoods and looking up and going, how in the world is it that we have an organism, a tree, that can take water down here, push it all the way up there, take that light that's shining on the leaves, make food out of it, and continue growing for thousands of years. It's pretty fascinating, kind of humbling to stand there and, and be at the bottom of one of these towering trees and kind of have a sense for what have they seen over all these years. They've seen quite a lot. Fires will not deter them. They have very thick skins. It's a good metaphor for life, is good thick skin sometimes. So that's it. That's my maker's mark and puts the uh, finishing touch on my woodwork. I'll put the finishing touch on my presentation as well. So. I welcome questions at this point. More questions. Everybody stunned into silence. You talk about working with wood. I used to do hand carving on wood mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff and then paint and everything. And that wood, like you say, smooth and the warmth and everything of that wood was uh, 
I enjoyed working with Liz well and never built stuff like you were doing, but that's awesome. Yeah, and it's a fairly forgiving material to work with too, as far as, oh man, I had a little boo-boo, you can, you can usually get around that too, so. Uh, what kind of wood do you... Uh, I mostly work with pine because it was pine. soft. Okay. Yeah. yeah, pine is soft. Uh, basswood is also great for carving, as I've been told. So, very good. What else? Questions on any of my woodwork or... Yes, Steve. As you look at uh, the next stage of your life, perhaps post-retirement, ever thought about uh, holding a doing custom furniture, that type of thing. You do it well. <laughs> uh, I don't plan on retiring uh, for many years, so I really haven't thought about that. Um, yeah, I, I gotta admit that I have considered building furniture for some sort of income, but um, you know the old saying, once it becomes your job, some, some things can become less, uh, less passionate or be more of a burden some and I'm not ready to test those waters just yet. I know there are a lot of starving woodworkers out there uh, but I'm going to see how this next so I have I have a list of four things that I want to do kind of my bucket list of woodworking and a guitar is the the next project. Um, if I can make a go of doing that not that I want to build guitars but that seems to me like this technical challenge that would really be able to say, yeah, I, I can do this. Um, that might tell me whether I'd be ready for bigger and better things as far as selling objects. But for now, it's just a fun hobby and something that decorates our, our uh, living room. Do so. you do wood carving as well as uh, contracted woodworking? No, not, not yet. I am definitely willing to give it a try though. I am, there, there is a, a gentleman named Peter Follinsby, who's from back east, uh, who does just gorgeous work. And I would really like to maybe follow some of his steps. In, in, uh, he's, a, he's a great wood, wood carver, I think. Uh, I'd sure like to try it. Maybe it would even be successful. Who knows? <laughs> I'm okay with failing on that too. Do you yes, have a description of the woodworking courses that you are presently teaching or plan to teach? Um, I can tell you really quickly what the, uh, what, what the content is. So for the woodworking class that I teach at the college, I focus the first half of the semester on learning good hand skills. So uh, every student is given two chisels, which they are to um, keep maintained. And in fact, I, I keep track of those on uh, like every three weeks. I check and see, are they sharp? Are they taking good care of them? Um, in addition to that, they're, they're going to make one of those assembly mallets, the, the hammer that I had in this video here. Uh, not video, this um, slide. They make one of those. Once we've gotten to this point and they finish this, they will have had lots of chisel experience comparatively to a, to a high school program anyway. Um, hand planing experience because the mallet head there is actually made round by planing instead of, it's not turned on a lathe. Yes, a lathe would be an easier way to do it, but it really demonstrates to them good technique and understanding of grain direction. Because every time they make a cut and then turn it, the grain direction starts to change and one false stroke across there will result in a big blowout of uh, a big chip. So good learning there. The second uh, portion of the class, we get a little more experience with machines like the table saw, uh, thickness planer, joiner, 
because they'll make a little bit bigger item. It's a, a workbench, not a workbench, a uh, small bench that you can sit on. And pretty simple, but has a, a bit more construction to it as opposed to this. The second project, that bench, they will do hand cut dovetails throughout. And that's where I really come back to this and go, but a 10 year old can do it. So focus, eat good layout, let's be nice and careful and uh, you'll have great looking really tight uh, joints on a dovetail. So we go hand tools, a little more into machinery and uh, do still uh, want that kind of handmade look from the dovetails being hand cut. That sound? I, 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 I majored in industrial arts at McPherson College uh, 60 years ago. Uh huh. And right. we didn't do that stuff. <laughs> no. <laughs> then, well, then in, uh, soon thereafter, I went to West Africa and taught in a handicraft school. Mm -hmm. There, I had to learn the use of hand tools and make yeah. tail joints, etc. Right. What I tell my students is, what you can afford to buy at a flea market would fill an entire shop with the same capability as if you were to buy lots of tool, you know, big machinery, but at a fraction of the cost. And as you get more accomplished, you can buy those bigger machines if you want to be able to do these things faster. But I think it's a great introduction into the, the concept of what is sharp, how, you know, how to use sharp tools without taking too much material off or things like that. Wonderful so, skills. Wonderful skills, yep. And skills that I find are very much foreign to all but a few students, even though these students are here specifically to use their hands to work on cars. Um, and it's usually, it, it's, it's not their fault. We've taken hand skills out of most of our high school curriculum, so they just don't get the opportunity to in most cases. I think we're seeing a little bit of a reversal on that. Not entirely. There's still that liability of passing around razor sharp chisels to a bunch of high schoolers. What could go wrong? Uh, but at least at the college level, they're quite respectful of that. Good. Other questions, comments? Anything to clarify? How are we on time? I see you standing up. We must be done. Gary, a big word of thanks to you this afternoon.